Um, uh, the, uh, the JCB has uh, one of the preeminent indigenous language collections, uh, collections of in, uh, works in indigenous languages of the Americas in the world. There are more than uh, 600 titles representing scores and scores of languages, and I will demonstrate that for you in just a second. Um, and those are all now accessible online to us, um, and which is a, a treasure. Uh, just, um, I, I can't even uh, articulate how exciting this is for those of us who work with these sorts of materials and have colleagues and students around the world who don't get to come here um, and look at these things. And so now they can. Um, the website, this is what you're looking at right now, is the JCB website itself. I went into uh, the online bibliographies and databases. And if you come to the to look at the Indigenous Languages, the Americas section, this will take you into a bibliography, an online bibliography. Of, of all the holdings, so there's some 600 titles here. And as I said, you can browse through it. And I just wanted to uh, show you the list of languages. Uh, Ken Ward uh, didn't know the exact number, and I decided not to count. Um, but as you can see, it's just a spectacular um, uh, collection of, 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 uh, of languages uh, representing um, all the different uh, parts of the Americas. Um, uh, as well, now this will eventually, this, this, uh, this bibliography will eventually be fully linked to the online uh, text themselves, but at present it's not, and you need to go through the archive.org site, which you've looked at with David Rumsey this morning, um, and uh, come down to the John Carter Barton Library Indigenous Collection, um, and that will take you to full text um, uh, PDFs that can be downloaded as well as read um, uh, online. And uh, a few months ago, I stumbled across this quite by chance. As I said, I don't work with indigenous language texts very often, but I was looking for the original of a, a, a paraphrase from uh, a um, sermon that Francisco de Avila, the rather infamous uh, 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 Peruvian uh, extirpator and priest, uh, gave a sermon in, six, in the 1640s, it was published in this uh, 1648 edition, and it turns out it's a joint Quechua and Castilian uh, uh, text, and it's here, and I was able to download the PDF of the entire book, which is still on my desktop, on my laptop, because I couldn't believe how beautiful it was, the, this, this lovely um, object, it's not an object, this lovely uh, thing um, was now accessible to me. I could page through it. So it was a really um, wonderful um, experience. The collection itself is rich with catechisms and vocabularies and grammars and dramatic dialogues and manuscripts. And I encourage you all, um, anyone with an internet connection, to go and uh, enjoy it. Everyone can now read, and everyone with a connection, which is not everyone, we need to keep in mind, uh, can read and study and rethink this text, these texts. And I just wanted to note uh, very briefly that the most downloaded uh, uh, JCB title is in fact the Arte de la Lengua General del Reino de Chile. It's a Mapuche uh, uh, grammar. It's actually not. A, sorry, it's a it's a a, a, a catechism, uh, confessionary uh, uh, dialogues in uh, in in uh, Mapuche. And for some reason, that is the text that people around the world have been downloading from this site. Um, so uh, and followed by uh, a Quechua uh, uh, grammar, um, uh, and then. Then we move away from indigenous languages. But it was sort of stunning to me that the most downloaded text is actually a Mapuche uh, text. Um, but um, this is all you know, remarkably exciting. And um, this morning, we've, we've been talking about this sort of new digital age. It, it's, it's been quite, quite thrilling. Um, but I don't have to tell the people in this room um, that experiencing the JCB collection in situ is quite a different experience from locating texts online. Um, uh, and while I really want to celebrate our increased access to these texts, um, I also want to celebrate the serendipity of those, of those conversations that uh, people have discussed about the conversations in the, in the hallway, in the break room, over dinner at Firing House. Um, 
And I was thinking about a few years ago when Ted first talked to me about his plan, his vision to create, to, to make the entire JCB library uh, free access. Um, uh, uh, I was thinking about, I mean, this conversation is taking place at a lot of different sites in the world at that moment. And in a lot of places, there was pushback. And you, you sort of mentioned that in your just comments this morning. A lot of pushback about what would happen, not just about how, what, we don't get to monetize this, but what happens to the library as an institution if all of our texts are now out there in the ether. Um, and um, that, that somehow um, that the brick and mortar structure um, as a depository is, is, it, it loses its value um, with this. But those doubts seem to have totally disappeared. Nobody really is worrying about um, that anymore. Um, and while I relish my ability to find a particular text, or in the case of something like this, to browse through a category of text to find uh, serendipitous things, um, I also know that my particular work has been shaped by conversations in person with all of you here um, and in other places. Um, going to the lunchtime talks on topics that I had no idea I had any interest in at all. <laughs> um, uh, and for just to find out that, 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 that th those talks on things that I had never thought about could shed light on my work and could make me think about my work in entirely different ways. People who handed me um, a across the, the rain reading room tables, little slips of paper and said, you know, you might be interested in this book uh, from the, 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 what you were saying before about your work. And it would be something that never even occurred to me to look for. Um, and so those generous suggestions and conversations um, uh, really opened my eyes to what this library is in terms of how it shapes who I am as a scholar. Um, the internet gives us masses of data, but it's those incredible human interactions that places like the JCB facilitate. Um, that's what turns our immature research programs um, that we, when we apply for our, our, our grants into vital and viable intellectual conversations. Um, and so today what I wanted to do with this panel, and oh, and I, I'm being incredibly um, rude, uh, Kitia Lee and I, um, I'm speaking on behalf of Kitia as well, my co-chair, I'm letting her not talk now because she's going to be a presenter. But what Kitty and I uh, 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 did was we contemplated scholars whose work has really changed the way we think about our, our work. And I include Kitty as someone who's really shaped my understanding, frankly, of, of linguistic uh, uh, texts and, um, and religious history and the history of the encounter. And so uh, what I'm, we're going to hear now from four scholars whose work in the Indigenous Languages Collection here has really made the rest of us uh, rethink our own work, which may be very far from that collection, um, uh, and also to approach our, our text with new eyes. So with no further ado, I'm going to go in um, alphabetical order. Our first speaker is Louise Burkhart, who is professor of anthropology at the University of Albany, at Albany, I just, she just corrected me of this. I had it written right, I will tell you. The University at Albany and specializes in the religion of uh, Nahuatl speakers in central Mexico. Um, many of us, I'm sure, have been shaped by her now seminal monograph, The Slippery Earth, and have benefited from her more recent forays into Nahuatl theater, including the four volumes of edited and translated plays, co-edited with Barry Sell, Stafford Poole, and Elizabeth Wright, and she is currently working on Nahuatl-based Castilian catechisms. Thank you, Karen, Kitia, Ted, Margo, everybody. <laughs> if you haven't been thanked enough yet, I'll, I'll end my own. Um, for me, the really important thing, personally, about the John Carter Brown Library has always been the large collection of Nahuatl or Aztec language, um, devotional, religious, catechistic, doctrinal uh, materials here, uh, mostly printed books, uh, you have almost everything. I could probably think of some things you guys don't have, but it's, it's an amazing collection. 
uh, and also uh, a more limited but very important <coughs> number of manuscript sources. Uh, just a few of the types of texts here are quite a lot of um, doctrinas, uh, some collections of sermons, some are interesting meditations, songs, some confession manuals, uh, speeches in Nala, uh, prayers, saints' legends, dramas, and those beautiful images from the scans from the website are being wiped out here by a couple of manuscripts that are still ugly scans of microfilms, but I look forward to one of those materials. Uh, join the printed books in the archive. Um, there's so much material. I've been working on this stuff since the early 1980s. And rather than try to do a, a survey or, or explanation, I just picked out a couple of my favorite things that kind of frame a long period of research um, that I've published on or published and, and worked on quite extensively. The first item I ever got from this library on microfilm when I was a grad student was the library's uh, copy of Fray Bernardino de Sahagún's the great Franciscan ethnographer, famous for his uh, Florentine Codex and other works. The only work of his actually published in his lifetime, the Samoria Cristiani Semonario de los Santos del Año en Lengua Mexicana, published in 1583, but originally written in the late 1550s <coughs> in collaboration with four of the indigenous uh, graduates of the Franciscan College, all, all notable scholars and noblemen in their own right. And uh, I know I got this on a microfilm. It was the first microfilm I ever had uh, when I was a grad student. And uh, worked it to death. Um, so then. It's also the only published book of Nawat Sons from the colonial period. And um, the copy here is, is one of six surviving copies of the imprint that was banned by the Mexican Inquisition, which may partially account for its rarity. <coughs> and based on my uh, now getting pretty long experience, I would consider it probably the most nativistic, printed, published Nahuatl Christian text in the sense that a lot of the material incorporates uh, a very indigenized um, perspective on Christian topics, which is the kind of thing that I've really been looking for and, and focused on. Not that you can't also find that in even the most standard canonical looking bilingual um, confession manual or doctrina, everything as it shifts into Nahuatl takes on uh, very different casts of meaning, but the Samoria is, is a particularly interesting one. Um, it's a hodgepodge of material that doesn't, it's not like anything else. It's a, it's a very unique, a unique creation of the collaboration between Franciscans and the Oa scholars in the 16th century. Um, it, it's presented as a psalmodia, but it isn't actually a book of psalms. Uh, the texts are divided into individual psalmos or cantos. Um, they aren't really things, in most cases, that you would sing, uh, although in some are written as songs. It's drawn from some collection of saints' legends, Los Santorum, or something similar, or more than one, actually. I haven't been able to find a, a single source. And also from uh, the Latin liturgy, which is sometimes um, quoted in the margins of the book. And the Nahuatl sometimes corresponds to the Latin, and, and sometimes it really doesn't. And that's one of the really interesting things when it gets this little stamp of approval in the margin and it's actually saying something different. Oops. And um, it's, in linguistic terms, it's in, it's in a lot of different registers. Uh, what's striking about it is that none of those stylistic registers is a sort of fire and brimstone, do what we say or you'll go to hell and suffer forever thing that you see in the sermons and in, in, in Sahagun's other um, Christian doctrinal writings. It's all either storytelling or it's, it's songs and celebrations. It's the most heavily illustrated um, colonial Nahuatl imprint with 52 or something like that. I, can, yeah. I, I, I didn't have the number of the books in Nahuatl. I can't tell you the number of the woodcuts in here. It's over 50. Um, mostly stuff brought in from Europe 
and recycled by Mexican presses here. This is at Pedro Charte's press. Um, the woodcuts are, are themselves <coughs> interesting and something that's obviously more accessible to people who don't have the native language training because they do show how um, Christian images were presented. They were models for Indo-Christian art. They were models for costuming, for pageants and, and dramas. Um, and there are quite, quite an array of, of the saints' stories, um, life, of, life of Christ, biblical stories, and, and so on in them. This is just a little selection. And something that I've lined it for extensively uh, in, in the more celebratory song-like texts is the way that it adapts uh, a, a very deep, um, widespread, and Yudo-Aztec and language family um, association of the sacred with, with flowers, with light, with color, with birds, with precious stones, all sort of re refracting solar energy and, and manifesting it uh, in the world as a, as a kind of life uh, force into Christian texts and just kind of flies under the radar uh, in a very indigenous, um, in some very indigenous material. I know you're not Nahuatl scholars mostly, but you can probably see the word. So she, or flower, over and over again in the flower songs, uh, they just they invoke this flower language. Um, and they're, they're really beautiful. My favorite one is this Christmas song. We actually got the, the birth gospel text from, from Luke uh, down the right side there in Latin. And there was with the angel uh, you know, praising God, singing yeah, glory to God in the highest and, and all that stuff. And the Nahuatl is, is just way out there with this um, beautiful song about tropical birds coming down to Bethlehem, and they're really angels, and they're praising God, and it just, it's, it's like, it's at the end of the book, and it's, it's wild, it's, it's really beautiful. So very creative things coming out of this collaboration uh, between Sahagun and the native scholars. Sahagun probably not even paying too much attention to some of this, uh, that got into a, a printed book, uh, and one of the most creative and I was counting up on my CV, I had like six articles um, in my first three books drawing heavily on this one source. So this is like the, the prize of my old microfilm collection that I, I guess I could just burn in a bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> now that I can get all these much nicer images from the, from the website. Um, and the second one I think yeah, is, is something that uh, is not yet uh, on the website, but I, I assume that these manuscripts will be coming on fairly soon. Um, and a particular interest, well, manuscripts uh, in general sometimes have stuff that would not have been approved for publication because of the intense um, inspection and censoring process that things, especially things in a native language, which was in itself controversial, had to go through before getting into print. Um, and this, uh, the, the, the project that Karen mentioned, the Nala Theater Project that I um, co-directed with Barry Sell, who was also a fellow here at, at one point during our research in the mid-2000. Uh, this is uh, one of two dramas at the JCB, and it's one that's actually um, written or edited or rewritten by an indigenous nobleman, Don Manuel de los Santos y Salazar, who was a Tlaxcalan Collin nobleman, historian, patriot, uh, chronicler, and parish priest at the time he wrote this play in, in Santa Cruz, Coscacua, Tlautipac, which was a dependency of the, the city of Tlaxcala in 1714. Uh, a year before his death. It was quite unusual for an indigenous man to be ordained as a Catholic priest. So he's an exceptional individual. And the play is about, uh, first, uh, the conversion of Const Emperor Constantine and his defeat of, I'm getting ahead of myself probably, uh, so I'll go to the next slide. Um, well, yeah, it's one of two plays in this collection, which doesn't sound like all that much, except that manuscript sources of the plays were all we had. No plays were published during the colonial period. They were just too controversial. And 
by my latest count, only 24 colonial play manuscripts are currently known to scholars, excluding a couple of fragmentary things and, and some copies. These are coming out of archives and local archives in Mexico, so these, this, those numbers will go up. Um, but two, two plays are here. We were able to put both of those in the fourth volume of NOAA Theater. And the play is a combination of the story of the Roman Emperor Constantine and his vision of a holy cross, which then led to his victory over his rival, Maxentius, and the famous Battle of Milvian Bridge over the Tiber River in 312 AD, uh, followed by his conversion to Christianity, which in the legend takes place a lot earlier than it really did. And then the second part of the play is the legend of his mother, St. Helen, and her discovery of the true cross in Jerusalem. So if we ask why the heck would Nawaz and Tlaxcala in the early 18th century want to put on a play about some oldie moldy Roman Empire emperor and his mom, um, <laughs> it's one of two. There's also a play about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and I, I sort of categorize these as, as Nawaz history plays. Uh, and I think both of them resonate with the history of the, you know, the, the big event, uh, the core event in Mexican indigenous history, the coming of uh, Spanish colonialism and Cortez and the conquest. And um, I think this play is an example of how native intellectuals like Santos and Salazar looked for similarities, parallels, uh, sort of double layers of meaning between old world and Christian events and their own local past so that they could tell Christian stories that also had a local meaning. For Tlaxcala, the key event in their history was the fact that they formed an alliance with Cortes that enabled them to beat their longtime enemies, the Mexica, uh, an alliance that for centuries they continued to, to milk and, and call on to claim privileges and favors from Spain. So it was still very important uh, even a couple hundred years later. And part of the legend of the conquest as it developed in Tlaxcala was the idea that the four rulers of Tlaxcala <coughs> accepted um, Christianity and were baptized right at the beginning of the alliance with Cortes when historically it actually probably happened a little bit later, but this is part of the story. And um, well, my analysis of the play, I, I draw parallels between the conquest uh, of Mexico and the story of, of, Constant, of Constantine, um, who because he accepts the cross, he is able to conquer his enemy um, with Rome, then paralleling Tenochtitlan, the big city, the goal, the prize. Uh, Constantine, like the Plus Collins, converting to Christianity, <coughs> and, and the enemy, Maxentius, um, being parallel to Botex. So even to the detail that in both stories they send sorcerers out to stop uh, Constantine or Cortes and his Plus Collins allies who find themselves powerless against this the divine power that the, that the other side possesses. So, that, so there's a parallel uh, a relationship there with the conquest story. And the cross story, and if you remember this, is written in a town whose patron divine thing, not really saint, is Santa Cruz, is the Holy Cross. So there was an, in, an interest uh, in the, the cross itself. Dun, dun, dun. The legend of the Magic Cross, supposedly, again, in, in the legends of Plus Collin history, a cross miraculously appeared during the night at the site uh, where Cortes had just had his first meeting with the two most powerful Plus Collin rulers, Shikapenkat and Mashishkatsin. And this cross uh, became an object of local devotion. Uh, people interpret it as a sort of world tree, sustenance tree, and made offerings to it. And then the cross was passed along, eventually, wore out, uh, was replaced, you got laid claim to by several different towns. Oh yeah, we have the real one, no, we have the real one. Uh, and the, so by the 18th century, um, a number of class colon towns were claiming to possess this uh, miraculous cross that had appeared 
um, at this key moment. So this imagery of conquest, of conversion uh, to Christianity being a key element uh, enabling the conquest is something that got kind of entrenched in Foss common history and I, I think helps us to understand why someone like um, Sankt Jesse Salazar, people in a town devoted to the Holy Cross might be interested in acting out a play that tells a story of, of uh, ancient events in the old world that have uh, resonances to them. Um, so it's just two texts out of all the, all the many here that have been very helpful to me and have so much more potential too and, and are so much more accessible. Um, not just to scholars around the world, <laughs> but also to, to indigenous people and most uh, contemporary Nahuatl speakers today, of whom there are somewhere between one and a half and two million, um, have been disenfranchised from their history, but some are, are starting to recover it, become literate in Nahuatl. Um, there's one debate over whether to use uh, international phonetic alphabet to represent contemporary Nahuatl or to use the old colonial orthography and some of us on uh, all sides of this think you know they should use the colonial one because that gives these people access um, <coughs> to the colonial literature in their own language of which there's such a large legacy and uh, which the library here has so much of and now it is more accessible to anyone with access to a computer um, so join with our or an, an indigenous man here confessing to a Franciscan, you can kind of see the power dynamic and the fact that he's the one with the devil uh, trying to drag him away. Um, and then just like, thank you, John Carter Brown Library, for your preservation of Nahuatl sources and, uh, and putting them online in the archive. Thank you. Thank you. is uh, Regina Harrison, who is Professor of Comparative Lit and Spanish at the University of Maryland. I'm not that short, but um, she's been recognized with a Guggenheim Fellowship, among, among, among many others, uh, for her pathbreaking work on Quechua language texts and performances in the Andes, including signs, songs, and memory in the Andes, translating Quechua language and culture, as well as works in catechisms, confessionals, and quibus. And her new book, imminent new book, um, has the working title, Translating Sin, Spanish Quechua Confessional Manuals in Colonial Peru. I'm starting out uh, because we were asked to start in a personal way and sort of trace our um, origins and our use of the JCB materials. So I wanted to go back to a uh, picture you already saw yesterday in Rolena Adorno's uh, address, keynote address. And I wanted to point out again the warmth of the JCB embrace. It's an intellectual embrace. And it's a very affectionate embrace, as you can see here uh, with uh, Norman Firing, and again uh, with Pepe Amori Vasquez, uh, also Julio Ortega joining the picture there. And I wanted to remember, because we've talked a lot about schmoozing, the greatest schmoozer of them all, David Adorno, mm -hmm. who is often the person with the camera taking uh, these more intimate uh, photographs of our work at JCB. Thank you so much for inviting me, Karen and Kitya, uh, to participate on this panel. Um, being at the JCB certainly did change the course of my uh, research. And I wanted to start with uh, how my own research kind of paralleled, I think, what JCB is doing, uh, getting to uh, the digital, uh, the the digital aspect of research. But returning again to the warmth of that embrace, I don't know if you were astounded, but I was. It's been many years since I was here as a fellow. But as I walked in the door, 
the staff was saying, hello, Regina, or even using my nickname. Hi, Reggie, it's good to see you again. I mean, weren't you amazed that they remembered your name? In fact, I think there's probably a secret archive of all our photographs. <laughs> <laughs> they went over to make sure we weren't imposters, you know, coming in to uh, steal the books or something. So anyhow, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna start with print page, all right, and, and then end up uh, with digital, and I hope the digital uh, comes through. This is me. Uh, this is how I still kind of consider myself. Uh, more at home during field work. This is the Tropical Forest, Ecuador. I had a generous grant from the Social Science Research Council and the American Council of Learned Societies, a two-year grant. And I needed all of that because as they pointed out in the interview, where I thought I had not gotten the grant at all, I didn't know Quechua, but yet my dissertation proposal <laughs> was to actually take Quechua songs and analyze them. So <laughs> fortunately, uh, I do know how to teach Spanish, so I taught a bilingual speaker, Quechua in Spanish, to teach me Quechua. And so there were many, many days of me saying, uh, do you have pineapples I can buy? Okay. <laughs> and uh, buying lots of pineapples uh, and being very worried because uh, I could overhear in my um, beginnings of Quechua that when I was sitting there and I wanted a woman to sing, uh, I heard the woman singer say to my uh, indigenous companion collaborator, Pai Kalsanshu? Is she alive? And so, you know, I'm very pale uh, in the tropical forest. But she actually meant, is she a living person? I.e., does she speak our language? And for a long time, no woman would even admit that she could sing a song uh, because I really hadn't matured enough to be able to participate with them uh, in their culture. And um, at this point, and then later on in the course of my dissertation, I was very happy in the contemporary world, all right? No colonial, just working with uh, Arguedas and Florinda Mato de Turner and her interest in Quechua, Juan Leon Mera and his Antología Equatoriana, where he includes Quechua songs, uh, until Rolena Adorno said to me, please write on Santa Cruz Pachacuti Salgamawa, no? And I said, I don't know what to begin with there. And I did find the songs, which somewhat related uh, to the songs I had been studying uh, in the dissertation. I um, began actually looking at uh, the verses and did, um, what we do in literature, a very close reading of these uh, songs in, in Quechua and later Quechua, um, beginning with some work on uh, Wamampoma as well. And of course, it requires a great deal of linguistic expertise. And I've depended very much on such great linguists as Bruce Mannheim, uh, Husson, uh, Adelard, um, just to name a few, uh, Cesar Etier, uh, Sabina Dedenbach Salazar, and uh, most recently, Alan Durston's uh, wonderful work uh, on this field. So when I give talks about um, my research, uh, I, I do want to include some commentary on the linguistics because Quechua, I think very differently from what we see in Mesoamerica, is not a language of brilliant colors, rabbits were coming from the east, you know. It's not like the Mesoamerican uh, beautiful images. The aesthetics and the beauty for me, and I think the linguists would uh, agree with this, uh, depend on an intricate sort of uh, lexical couplet that goes on and these parallel lexemes. And this isn't unusual in indigenous languages. Uh, many couplets are formed. But here to give uh, an idea of what's going on, I've, I've translated this uh, kind of literally. Uh, we see that, first of all, there are two words for water uh, which begin uh, these two statements. Uh, unui and yakui, uh, and yakui is the one used uh, commonly in Ecuador in outlying areas of the, of the Andean um, limits of Quechua. Unui, more used around the Cusco area. So this Wamampoma poem is in fact, as Bruce Mannheim points out, 
uh, making reference to the two dialects, the two um, major language differences. And then we can see another parallelism too, the actual repetition that you see here uh, in these endings. But I think in this is where the language becomes very interesting. The use of pairs where the first pair is one statement and the second pair uh, elaborates upon that semantic concept, but is a different concept itself. So wiki here would be uh, tears, all right, so the concept of liquid, and para down here, uh, rain. So we have a beautiful um, poetic and lyric expression right here based on a parallel. Over here in the, whoops, over here in the verbs, uh, we have the re of inception, to begin to do something, okay? The Juan of to me. And these two verbs are related as well. Apai is a verb for just carrying something on your back. Uh, but then Pusai is very different in that it means something is carried uh, to you and someone's generally bringing that item to you. All right, everyone's eyes are glazing over, yes. Uh, this is always what happens when uh, I start getting into the linguistics. Uh, and so part of the challenge in dealing with indigenous materials is learning how to try to explain uh, the intricacies of the language uh, to people who do not, um, who are not scholars of that language. Okay. Um, fortunately, I was up at Cornell. I had a manic period where I was really interested in potatoes, and Cornell's the place to do that with all their agricultural holdings, okay? <laughs> and it turned into uh, the last chapter of my first book, which is the potato as cultural metaphor, okay? And luckily up there, I don't see Monica Barnes here uh, at the moment, but I owe a good, great debt to her because she said, ah, you're doing translation, go to my carol in the library and look at all the catechisms that I have there already just waiting for you, you know. Very generously, she guided me into that. And Bruce Mannheim was up there at that time too, and he goes, make copies of all of these facsimiles and these editions, because you'll need to take them with you to Bates College, uh, where I was at the time. Um, and so she guided me towards uh, the annotaciones, which are in the 1584 uh, catechism material. My favorite of all the JCB holdings is, of course, uh, the superb uh, confession manual by Juan Perez Bocanegra, 1631. Luckily, Susan Danforth insisted that I take a uh, microfilm of this with me, and I am so pleased it's now uh, up online, because I don't know about you, but quickly going through microfilms is like being on a, a boat and uh, kind of nauseating. So it's really good to see the pages flip, you know, uh, and, and uh. so here we have uh, the confession manuals that I first started out with, and they range from uh, a very short confession, a general confession, 1560, um, the big um, confessional materials in 1584 and uh, 1585, one by Ore in 1589, and 1619 Torres Rubio, and also Prado's um, confessional in 1650, uh, earlier than that too. And as I left JCB, uh, I had just so many notes on everything uh, because Again, I come literally out of the jungle <laughs> into colonial research, and I must admit I really didn't know what I was doing. So it's taken all these years to finally write this material up. And I'm so grateful to Michael Hammersley for giving us that wonderful annotated uh, bibliography, telling me not only where things are in JCB, but letting me know that in the Library of Congress there is a copy that I can uh, look at and not have to travel here uh, sometimes. Um, I followed up with my work here at JCB, again, doing uh, contemporary field work. I was so invested in confession that I returned to Peru and Ecuador and talked to priests 
uh, and indigenous people, what is it that they confess? The confession manuals are often set up with the Ten Commandments. You go through each one of them, okay? And um, the priests would tell me that uh, the indigenous people confessed very different sins. Uh, of course, the idea of sin at the moment of contact, okay, in that contact zone, was very different from one culture to the other. So a lot of my work uh, here at JCB, the beginning work, was on defining what hucha, sin, was originally, as far as we can tell, in these mediated materials that we have uh, for the Incan peoples. But you can see here a confessional uh, process in Sarwa, uh, and the priest is accused of meddling in things, uh, and that's what it says in that, uh, in, in that label in the, in the right. But as you can see from the selection I have here from the manual, I did get stuck at the JCB uh, looking at the differences in the Sixth Commandment. And you can see which one that is. No for me garas, you know. <laughs> Do not have sexual congress, okay? And I um, did talk with Norman uh, yesterday, and he said, I'll never forget your luncheon when you <laughs> talked, okay, because I did concentrate on uh, sex, and, um, and I had gotten through the preferred sexual positions um, <laughs> mandated by the Catholic Church, and I think I got through um, mm -hmm masturbation and um, self-pollution, and uh, then I was getting on to uh, bestiality, and I think that was around dessert. <laughs> and so Norman said, I, you know, I remember that one fairly well. <laughs> okay. And I found that I was asked to give talks about this everywhere, you know? Uh, so the Sixth Commandment was a, 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 a really profitable uh, <laughs> launching uh, for working on this. In the contemporary fieldwork, I had the really good fortune to speak with a priest who actually had seen a quipu being used in confession. And I had been drawn to this because Perez Bocanegra, in his warnings to uh, confessors, gives us a whole list of things uh, uh, for the priest to look uh, at. As, and he talks uh, in anecdotal uh, circumstances about kipus being used for, for one confession and then being passed to the next person, the same kipu, right? So he said it's, it's really astounding to hear a seven-year-old child confessing uh, these really elaborate sexual sins. And, uh, it, and so that turned into a, a wonderful article with uh, reference to what colors on very simple kipus were used uh, in about the 1940s, according uh, to this priest. Okay. I'm not a linguist. Uh, I originally thought I might like to do something with the grammars, um, but I think I'm going to leave that uh, for linguists to attempt. I do want to mention, though, that there is room for doing some work uh, in kind of reading, for us who aren't linguists, reading between the lines, such as um, in this one down here, it says um, how much, uh, I think it's there, yeah. How, how much, no, up here. How much money did you give to the Koraka? All right, so there are all sorts of um, sample sentences given that I think could be a kind of an interesting comparative project uh, as we turn to the art, um, art base and the, and the vocabularies. Uh, I did work on um, looking at elicitation lists, uh, taking the old Nebrija um, vocabulary and comparing it to the first vocabulary, you know, the 1560 vocabulary, and looking where the blank spaces were. And I'm glad that Al Alfredo Torero also looked at that. Uh, it's quite obvious, some things like um, apio, all right, celery, okay, is that, yeah. Uh, there's a blank, okay, great, there's a blank. But there are also blanks for concepts such as reno, um, and also competition, right? Those are competition, uh, have blanks in them. 
Okay, so I wanted um, to now go to um, what I first found at JCB, looking at uh, the, man, the printed book, Arte de los Metales, by um, Alonso Barba, uh, and, and being fascinated with all the detail in there, which was necessary to understand one of the confessions, the uh, confessional sections that Perez Boca Negra had elaborated upon, and that was, Thou shalt not steal. And he includes in uh, Commandment 7 all sorts of items, Quechua uh, vocabulary for working in the mind. So I had to really depend on Bakewell and Cole, who've done such wonderful work in Potosi, to begin to understand what has become uh, two chapters in the book, which is uh, commerce. And uh, the, the confession manuals uh, reflecting commerce. Um, and of course, I um, benefited being here at the JCB, finding all of these wonderful images, returning to them, uh, years later, seeing uh, in, in um, uh, the work on Potosi, the wairas that uh, the Indians used to melt down the ore, which meant that they were in control of uh, the profits from silver mining uh, in the beginning uh, of, of 1545 when they opened the mines up. The interest in Potosi led me to take a huge leap, and uh, this was to go into video making. I had done a pre previous video where my students at Bates College and I had collaborated uh, in a film called Cashing In on Culture. It's about um, tourists coming to indigenous villages, sort of cultural tourism uh, in the tropical forest of Ecuador. And I thought, well, instead of, I, then went to the University of Maryland, where many of my colleagues were beginning to make videos themselves. Um, and I was encouraged by my colleagues to get into video production. I learned from graduate students who were doing their dissertations on film. Uh, I was taught how to focus, uh, how to uh, string things together. I learned how to edit. I, for this uh, video, actually um, hired a composer to uh, do the music that, that went with the history of Potosi. I also made it in uh, Spanish so that uh, it could have a wider distribution, uh, particularly in the Andes. Uh, it's uh, kind of a grim video. Uh, you can imagine, given the material, the millions of indigenous people who died in the mining process, and that is brought out in the colonial period, which is about a good five minutes of the 40-minute uh, film. So often when I accompany the film, after it's over, it, there's absolute silence, and no one is daring to ask a question because it's, it's just so grim. So um, I, I do know, though, that there is one laugh moment in it, okay? And I put this in to kind of lighten it up a little. And, uh, this is the passage where it gets lighter. Uh, these are two Quechua-speaking miners uh, who agreed to be filmed and also signed the releases to be filmed like we did too, okay? <laughs> and uh, if this works, hopefully we'll see a little of this passage. Oops, nope, no. Nope. No. Um, some help with the 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 off the audio. No, we practice. <laughs> okay. So now. Por eso que vienen si es muy agradable para no. Por esta no, no va para nada. Of the 
about 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll go on to this one, all right? Um, I know having the privilege of working with NEH and uh, participating in um, the NEH seminar at the Newberry Library and then being asked to be one of the teaching faculty in uh, several others. I think, Rolanda, you were busy somewhere else and they called me <laughs> as backup. Uh, we're often concerned about uh, the dissemination of our research. And this is something that NEH often uh, has us fill out at the uh, end of a session. Uh, how are you going to have your research disseminated? So video to me was kind of a natural response. And I think also in teaching at the University of Maryland, uh, I've had a really wonderful experience in exposing students who otherwise would not be looking at Latin America or at all interested in the colonial period uh, by participating in the <coughs> honors uh, classes at the college. And I did one called True Confessions, where the majority of the students were in accounting, uh, in business, uh, in physics, uh, also in computer science. And they were exposed to Las Casas and his reglas for uh, confessors. They were exposed to Perez de Boca Negra and the rules for confessing sexual sins, and as well as uh, the concept of tortured confessions, such as in the Pinochet regime, uh, as well as um, false memory confessions. So we did a lot of it. Part of the project was for them to be creative and to actually make uh, videos themselves or do a creative project. And I brought this as a sample of what Las Casas and Perez Boca Negra morphed into. Got a secret, can you keep it? Swear this one you say. Better lock it in your pocket, taking this one to the grave. If I show you, then no, you won't tell what I said. Cause two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. some ways of expanding beyond the archive. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, I apologize to all the hungry people in the room, um, but you know, we'll make Dana and Kitty speak really fast. Um, uh, next up is Kitty Lee, who is my, um, my beloved co-chair for this panel, <laughs> I can't thank enough. She's assistant professor of colonial Latin American history at Cal State Los Angeles. 
She's revising her 2006 dissertation from Johns Hopkins with the assistance of numerous grants, including the Lewis Hankey Prize from the AHA and a JCB Fellowship, into a much anticipated study about the historical and linguistic development of the, a native language of Brazil as a lingua franca throughout Portuguese America during the 16th to 18th centuries. Thank you for the introduction, Karen. And I just want to say very briefly a, a big thank you to Ted, to Margo, the JCB staff, my fellow planning committee um, for organizing this wonderful event, and all of you for sharing your work, your insights, trends about, uh, about your field. Um, and lastly, and very importantly, I also want to give a thanks to the Nishimura family, um, if Margo is in here, for their kind hospitality the last few days. So my presentation today Oops. So today what I'd like to do is um, spend some time talking about, talking about, talking about a, a, a trade vocabulary uh, written in the first half of the 16th century, um, which is among the first uh, Tupi Guarani language texts that I looked at when I first arrived here over a decade ago. Um, and for reasons that you'll see in a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll show it on, on screen. Um, I didn't really know what to do with it. It seemed very straightforward to just be, okay, this is dealing with trade. Um, but in the last year, I picked it up again, um, and I was able to spend a little bit more time thinking about it uh, when I returned to the JCB. Uh, and for those of you who were here about six months ago and, and heard the talk I gave, I'm gonna be sort of talking about the non a linguistic content of the Tupi Guarani side in today's conversation. I thought maybe it might be sort of useful to, to, to talk more about how this vocabulary for somebody who doesn't read this language might enliven some of the history and pro provide perhaps some new working conclusions um, for this time period. Um, and before I go on, I also want to say something about how exceptional this particular document is. Um, as many of you know, and, and as Luis showed, a lot of the materials that we deal with in these indigenous language texts tend to be, um, a lot of them, catechetical. Um, and there's also a body of material that references botanical or zo zoological um, local flora and fauna. Um, but this is one of two trade vocabularies um, that, that at least I know about from the 16th century. So in, in that sense, it makes it um, special as, as an exception. Um, this was written by an Italian passenger on board a Spanish expedition, um, of which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Uh, and for the purposes of my own research, per perhaps one of the most important and self-evident features about this vocabulary is the fact that it evinces, by the very early date of 1519, the linguistic affiliation of these Indians who were interacting with the Europeans who arrived after the Portuguese landfall and, and official discovery of Brazil. That is the Tupi Guarani linguistic affiliation, a matter that scholars have conjectured up until now but, but haven't turned to this document um, for evidence. Um, and so, as I said, today I'm going to be sharing my work that precludes linguistic knowledge of Tupi Guarani, and I'd like to try to do so. Um, the way, I guess, with the craft of the historian. That is to try to situate this vocabulary within the context of its times um, and also within the specialized literature. And to do so, I'm going to reference the only other known vocabulary from the 16th century, or rather trade vocabulary from the 16th century, um, which was written by a French man in the same region that Pigafetta wrote his about two decades later. Um, so I'll, I'll reference it very briefly, just as a point of comparison and contrast, as will I also silently footnote the travel narratives um, and the, the scholarship, the maps that have uh, been written to reflect on a very little studied matter, which is that of inter-ethnic relations in the first few decades of the 16th century. In so doing, I'm going to attempt to illuminate what I think of as a very slippery subject, and this is where your input can help me refine my thoughts, the very sli slippery subject matter of indigenous motives, desires, and interests. Um, part of the reason that this topic about interethnic relations in the early era uh, of Portuguese America is so understudied is because there are very few sources um, about, the matter, about the time period at all. And among these few sources that do exist, 
Um, most of them reference the, the trade in Brazil wood, which uh, was a, a dye wood that tinged fabric, sort of a, a red orange color, something like this. Um, and, and so given sort of that, what little is written about the, the early era it deals with Brazil wood. There's actually very little um, substantive long-term study about the commerce itself, and very specifically about the relations between Indians and Europeans that actually sustained and propelled this commerce on the Brazilian side. So here we have this vocabulary about which I've said much. Um, and you can see it's, at first glance, it really doesn't seem like much. It's eight items, um, and you'll notice Right? So reference to a thing with a seed that's about the same as a chickpea, very familiar food item to Southern Europeans, and then flour, this is actually wheat, flour of manioc, um, fish hook, knife, comb, scissors, bell, maybe some of the bells that we heard about in last night's musical performance. Um, but sort of what one imagines to be a standard trading list um, that could almost represent any group coming from Europe to meet with uh, natives in the Pacific Islands, in, uh, as well as throughout the Americas and elsewhere. Now, I look at this vocabulary as sort of a reminder of another objective, unrelated entirely to the Brazil wood trade, that brought Europeans to the coast and into spoken dealings with its inhabitants. Um, the author, Antonio Pigafetta, uh, was a, a, a volunteer aboard the expedition commanded by a uh, Portuguese navigator, Ferdinand Magellan, for the Spanish expedition to circumnavigate the world. And this was from 1519 to 1522. He wrote this, he made the first list in 1519. The objective of this expedition was um, Spain's race against Portugal to, to control European trade to spices. Um, by, and, and so they sought to do so, Magellan's expedition sought to do so by locating a western sea route, right, to echo the ambitions of Christopher Columbus, to locate a western sea route um, across to the Moluccas, which was known then as the Spice Islands to Europeans, and the source of spices. Uh, Pigafetta took down this vocabulary during his first stop on this expedition, when Magellan cast anchor in the Bay of Guanabara, which is the harbor on which, uh, outside of which the modern city of Rio de Janeiro sits. Um, and mainly, the purpose of stopping off there was just a matter of replenishing the vessels and lifting the spirits and nourishing the scurvy, strip-stricken, malnourished, um, uh, nearly mutinous crew. And this point, I think, is important, this point in sort of the Spanish-Portuguese dynamics and politics. After Magellan had sailed too far um, into the Atlantic to want to go back, he discovered that food rations were actually extremely low, much lower than he had mm -hmm. ordered and that he had witnessed being loaded onto the ship. So for the 10 weeks that these ships sailed before arriving to the Bay of Guanabara, the crew had to satisfy themselves with substantially uh, limited food rations. And so we can see, right, this, this is the context in which we can understand a very clear interest in trade for what, in trade for what is referred to as trinkets in some of the literature as well as the colonial documents for foods. So whereas this small document really is exclusive in its focus on trade, the French vocabulary, the one that I'm, I'm going to compare it with, um, written by a man named Jehan Lamy, it, it's not so exclusive on trade, it includes a lot of other text, which uh, we can talk about and, and answer a question about sort of the, 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 the deeper engage, engagement with this language. But what it does do is it occupies, the, the matter of trade occupies about a quarter, a little bit over a quarter of the record with a total of 26 entries. And what I'm trying to do here is sort of break them down into the things that were local, Brazilian flora, fauna, carrots, which were very prized in the trade um, as gifts to patrons, to royalty, um, local flora that could be ingested, right, so maize and gourd, as well as things that the Indians themselves manufactured. Uh, the maize beer and the hammock. Um, and then, so that's on the local side, and then the imported things that were being brought over by the Europeans, among the many things uh, that were listed, they fall really into two categories. Things that I think of as essential to the exchange at hand, 
metal tools, axe, curved blade, knife, scissors, and, and I've just listed here a few of many other metal things. Um, and the things that perhaps were interesting because they were in interesting to the natives because they were different, they were European, they were exotic, they might have uh, been used ritually or ceremonially, like a shirt and hat. Um, and so you'll notice the, the, the bolded things are the items that actually cross over in the two lists. Local things, important things. Food, uh, metal, metalware. So you see the same thing, right? A reminder about the items, the same items that Prefectus list has. And so this is where I see a bit of a difference. Whereas initially, when I first looked at Prefectus document, I didn't really see anything else about it other than it was very minute. I started to understand something about the paucity, or what seems to be the paucity of Prefectus vocabulary given the context in which he was writing this and in which he was traveling. Um, and so this is where I, I view the, the document, the vocabulary, as something of a script uh, that reflects as much the, the, the crew's experience during that expedition, during that first part of the expedition, as does it also reflect a European attempt to overturn Tupi Guarani advantage in trade. Um, and so, we have to take a step back and think of another context. And that is the question, the very tricky question of appropriately outfitting an expedition that was going to take a, a, an unknown route, an uncertain route, and perhaps arrive in lands um, where previous intelligence uh, was, previous European intelligence didn't inform the outfitters about the appropriate merchandise to bring on. Um, but the man who outfitted this expedition was extremely uh, experienced. He had years of experience uh, working on Portuguese, Spanish, and Italian expeditions uh, far and wide. And so what he provided for Magell Magellan's ships were, and I'm going to read here, bolts of textiles, 20,000 bells, 10,000 fish hooks, 1,000 mirrors, in addition <coughs> to German knives, brass basins, bracelets of brass and copper, and these ranged in size, in grade, in quality from the cheapest to the choicest of its kind. Now, it's not clear if this outfitter specifically planned in mind the, the, the needs of the, the material needs or material interests of the inhabitants of Brazil. Um, but certainly what we do know is that the expectations of the Europeans were quite clear. Uh, they knew that the voyage would be long. Um, they knew that it would be filled with unanticipated adventures and perhaps even some calamities like the food shortage. So I suggest here that the reasons for this short list and the reasons that um, restrained the Europeans in the items that they handed to the natives uh, that they met with in Brazil, right, limited it to these things that are, are considered trinkets, was because this was really the first stop among an unanticipated uh, journey, a journey of unanticipated length. And so they wanted to restrain themselves lest they deplete the actual holdings that they had, which might come in handy later. Such concerns motivated Magellan to invite João Lopes de Carvalho, who had lived for four years in Brazil, to share intelligence about the lowest grade of goods, um, and therefore identifying their names on the vocabulary, that could still purchase food. In other words, the ability of the Europeans to anticipate and provide the minimal of indigenous expectations informed the brevity of Pigafetta's vocabulary. The vocabulary contained the most essential of terms required to satisfy European needs. Foods rich in proteins and carbohydrates, such as maize uh, and manioc flour, for the hungry mariners and the cheapest metal goods that the Europeans could give away without offending their hosts. Is there no more? So uh, a couple of other comparisons that I want to draw here between the two, some of, some of the working conclusions that I've drawn by comparing the two vocabularies, um, as well as looking at the historical material, identifies some other, some other themes that I want to talk about. First of all, that both of these lists are written in this same indigenous language suggests to me, indicates to me, the continued reliance on indigenous lexica and no apparent European loanwords, even for the items that they introduced. Um, and then second are these three or four moments that have been captured by the few documents, historical documents that do exist, that suggest a change in the class of goods that were being offered by the Europeans to the natives. 
So the first moment is in 1500, with the arrival, the official arrival of the Portuguese and the official discovery of the Portuguese of Brazil. And during this, these moments, during these, I think there were 10 days, the items that were being given to the Indians were um, shirts, hats that were taken from the very heads of the sailors themselves, bells, bangles. So again, these things that constitute sort of less, less required, less essential items. Whereas in 1511, we have references to metal tools. We don't know what kind, but we know that these are metal tools for an expedition that very specifically was outfitted for the trade of Brazil. And then we have Kiga Fitz's list in 1590, which shows again the presence of more metal, uh, metal, metal objects. And then the 1540 French document that I've referenced here um, actually includes, if you remember, there's axe, there's a curved knife, there's more heavy duty type of edgeware, right? That would have been more expensive than a hat that somebody <laughs> took off of their own heads. And so this is leading me to suggest that the Europeans actually had to alter their behavior as well as their trade expectations in order to comply with the demands of the natives, um, especially given that some of them had more immediate needs of physical privation, um, uh, as well as the other ones who had these longer term interests in profitable trade in the Brazil wood. And then just the last point that I want to reflect upon is, I don't know if anyone noticed, but in nowhere in the two lists of trade items is the name for the wood, the actual Brazil wood, which <laughs> brought so many Europeans over to the colony, and nowhere does that appear. And if you recall, right, right here we have Pica Ventus list, there's no, there's nothing, you can't cut down a tree with a fish hook, right? Especially a hardwood like Brazil. So the absence of these terms suggests to me a specialization in the personnel behind the trade. An agent, for example, a professional agent who oversaw the barter for something that was an important commodity um, versus the experiences of individual mariners who might have had some penchant for language learning or something, um, or perhaps experienced crew who had recalled a few words and were able to help mediate this exchange of goods for, for items of personal consumption. Now, this last part about this professional agent, I admit it's not exactly a new finding. Um, Capistrano de Abril and, and many other scholars have shown us that the Portuguese uh, borrowed from the model that they had of colonization on the West African continent, West African coast, that of building training factories um, and, and appointing on-site factors who were the ones who were supposed to negotiate all affairs with the Indians, specifically trade, but all other affairs. So much so that crew was not allowed to, to, to go on shore um, uh, or they were allowed to go on shore only as far as the factory, but not beyond that. So no individual interactions with, with, the, with the natives. Um, scholars have also reflected on a distinct other French model, um, which focused negotiation, the power of negotiation, in the hands of local agents and interpreters um, in French named Truchimons, living on the land and often they were integrated into indigenous societies, right? So in both models, you have these individual specialized professional men who, who deal with all the trade affairs. So if the Portuguese and the French develop these distinct models of, of exploiting the dive wood um, by, by way of an on-site bilingual commercial agent, then what I'd like to suggest is that Pico Fentes' work offers the role of an additional type of interlocutor um, one whose presence revises the concept of that sole interpreter, that sole broker in inter-ethnic trade. And moreover, um, the document also provides the raw data, the linguistic data, for scholars who do study the Tupi Guarani linguistic features of the vocabulary, as well as it enlivens the past utterances, it, it enlivens, it brings for us, it tells us a little bit more what types of things exactly they were talking about. Um, and what that, what that references. Um, for mariners who had no too low language skills, who chose to deal directly with the natives. And, and so it's in this sense that I see this Italian man's vocabulary written not so much as a guide for future travelers who wanted to learn to speak with the natives, but as a script reflecting typologies of speakers. And so in this case, the typology was, would be somebody with admittedly low to perhaps no proficiency in the language, but how nonetheless they accessed and thereby sustained the use of this indig indigenous lingua franca 
uh, indigenous language as a lingua franca through, throughout the, the, the colonization era. Thank you. Thanks, Kidia. Um, and so our final speaker is someone who speaks almost as quickly as I do. Uh, Dana Leibson is a Priscilla Payne Vanderpool Professor of Art History at Smith College. Her work focuses on indigenous visual culture in Latin America, colonial Latin America. Her recent publications include Script and Glyph, Pre-Hispanic History, Colonial Bookmaking, and the Historia Tolteca Chichimeca. Um, and she's recently received a collaborative fellowship from the ACLS with Carolyn Dean for a project called Colonial Things, Cosmopolitan Thinking, locating the indigenous art of Spanish America, as well as a Mellon Fellowship to study the trade between China and Mexico. And those of you who are still sitting here, um, I appreciate that as well. Um, what I would like to do is pick up on a couple of the themes that Karen and Kitty have threw to us to think about. One was our methodology, what is things we work with in the JCBL, and then also some thinking about the new digital projects. So I'm going to kind of put all of that together very quickly, I hope. Um, but the theme that I want to highlight really is the fracture and circulation of indigenous images. I'm an art historian by training. I work mostly on central Mexico. And although I read Nahuatl documents, I'm particularly interested in the way that languages, both visual as in pictorial and textual, work together. So I'm going to take the idea of an indigenous language very broadly today and talk largely about colonial images created by indigenous people. You can hear me, yes? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so I want to begin with a couple of basic points. Um, and as you'll know, this is not an image by an indigenous person. But I want to um, just be clear that it's much easier for us to see images of indigenous people than images by indigenous people. And I think that's an important distinction, the images of and about indigenous people as opposed to those that are produced by them. And I brought in um, an example from Bartolome de las Casas. This is a de Bray image. A very heavy circulation in the, from the early modern period and certainly since then. And I just want to suggest that one reason I think it's obvious that images of indigenous people can be so much easier to see is they were often printed in books. Those books were preserved, those books were circulated, images circulated on their own outside of Mexico and the Americas. And so there's that kind of um, book culture, if you will, print culture production of images that we want to think about as well as preservation. I think the other thing that I mean by easier to see is that this is a visual language that if you're trained in the Euro-American tradition, you understand. You understand the session into space, you understand continuous narrative, um, we understand what it is for somebody to carry this heavy anchor, we understand this as an enclosed space. The iconography isn't so difficult to parse out. In contrast, images by indigenous people circulate much less frequently. Um, that's true certainly in the early colonial, certainly in the colonial period, the early modern period, but um, in part because they're on manuscripts, um, largely, and for Mexico, they're on walls, painted walls of churches, and those don't move around so much. Um, I also want to suggest that an image like this is a little more difficult to piece out, and um, we understand it's a scene of sacrifice, and it comes from a manuscript. I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, um, by Wanda, um, authored by Wanda Tafar, um, but I want to suggest that beyond the iconography, this is not such an easy image for us to read. And this is um, one of the things that makes it very interesting to me that we now use, or that we now can use, digital archives. Um, and I want to take a moment here. I think this is my moment. Uh, let's see how well I am. There it is, sorry. Um, I want to go to the archive of early American images that David Ramsey talked about this morning, and I suspect many of you know. And one of the things that art historians are good at is sort of the showing and telling. 
And I wanted to bring up this image from the Tovar manuscript um, and give you a sense of how it might be read in part through the wonders of the, the archival, I mean the digital world, but also what it means to kind of look at an image closely. Um, it is a scene of sacrifice. It comes from a manuscript that was produced in the late 16th century. Juan de Tovar um, was working in um, the Jesuit tradition. He, for some of you may know his work, he was an informant and he shared his materials with Acosta, and which led to the natural history. Um, he had the, the um, document here in the John Carter Brown Library is related to other histories um, of Mexico, indigenous images, Spanish text. So when I look at an image like this, one of the things that I'm interested in, and I do this particularly with students, is I'm interested in questions of facture. Can we figure out how this image was made? And I think one of the things that we can begin to tell when we look closely, and I'm hoping you're going to be able to see this with the mouse, right? Is we can see that the arm here was made before this piece here, which overlaps with it. And as we trace our ways across the image, we begin to see something about how the indigenous artist worked. We can see a trace of sketch line here for the shoulder. We can see the outline and the sketch line of the temple here. So we get some sense of not only sketching, sketching in a different color, but then the slight movement of images as the image came together. The other thing we can tell is that this sacrificial victim was painted before the temple. Because um, you can see that from the way the temple lines overlap here, 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 and here. And if we scroll or we wing to the bottom, we can see particularly right in here, we get a sense of the fact that the bodies were put into the image before the landscape. Now, kind of so what, right? I mean, that tells us so, isn't that interesting? And there is that sort of whole art historical fetish, oh, they just want to look really closely at images. We do, we want to look really closely at images. But one of the things that I want to argue for you is that this close looking of the image, and particularly made possible through digital work, and Ted mentioned this earlier today, he said sometimes you can see things in the digital archive that you can't see when you're looking at the original. One of the things it can tell us about is certainly how pigment was applied to paper, in this case, for this particular image, but it also tells us something about the language of an image as it's created through gesture, through the use of materials, and its conceptual framework. So obviously we're not going to write an indigenous history of images or an image, a history of indigenous images even based on one image or even an image and not looking at the text that's associated with it. But when we compare images like this to others, we find that sometimes the landscape goes in first and that the bodies come later. Sometimes we find that architectural features come first, then bodies, then landscape. Sometimes it's a very different arrangement. And what we can begin to piece together is something of what the conceptual ideas were that indigenous people were working with when they were making paintings in the 16th century. I think this is important um, in part because it gives us some sense of a different kind of language, right? Um, and many of us, when we read our documents, we do want to think about how are the words chosen, how are phrases put together, what kinds of absences are there in the text. It's not just what is said. But I also think it's important because if we think about indigenous images as an alternate ontology, this is a phrase that came up yesterday in the um, Sloan panel, if we think of them as challenging the ways that other modes of representing the world work, we need to really know how they work. And so I think this is one of the things that's important about reading images closely, but then also this digital piece. There's one other point I was going to make with the digital um, piece back here, and this is a, this is a different codex, and it's one I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, this is a codex from the 18th century, also here in the John Carter Brown Library. It's from a group of codices called the Tetraeloyon codices, and that may be familiar to some of you, maybe not to others. But the point I'd like to make here is really a point about materiality and the possibilities of digital work. Um, the Tetraeloyon codices were all painted on indigenous art paper. Um, and that was an intentional choice, even though regular European style paper was being used heavily by native communities in the 18th century in central Mexico. These were meant to be archaizing, or documents, documents that looked old and that sort of told an old time story about the past. And so the use of old paper, even though it wasn't so old, it looked old, right? Because it was an indigenous 
his style, um, was important in the context in which the documents were made and used. Our ability to zoom in on the kind of detail like this tells us something about that materiality. And I think that's an important way of understanding how an object like this worked very differently, was made very differently than the one we just looked at a moment ago. Right? So it's not a surprise that there are differences, but those differences aren't so easy to understand, particularly when it comes to how difficult it can be to hold the indigenous painted documents. This has come up before, and I want to come at it from a slightly different angle. Um, and that is sort of the wonders of the digital technology. Certainly access is important, and I don't want to in any way under, undercut that. But there are two other points that I would like to make, particularly about the access that the Brown, the John Carter Brown Library is making possible. One is, and this is particularly important I found for teaching, is that it is also taken seriously the idea of stability the archive's always there. I have never come to the archive online and found that it was down for maintenance, that it's been moved to a different site, that it's gone someplace else. And when you think about how you work with things on the web, sometimes things that were there on Tuesday morning aren't there when you go to Thursday morning to teach with them unless you very carefully save them and everything else. So I want to make an argument for importance of thinking about the stability of digital archives and also their longevity. Technologies that we use for looking at images online now, or, um, books online now, are not going to be the ones we use 15 years from now. But the ability to keep that going, I think, is something that we want to think about as crucial with our digital work. The other thing that I wanted to mention is we tend to be, as scholars, consumers of digital images, whether they're pictorial images or whether they're book um, texts and or maps. I would wonder if we might also begin to think about digital technologies as being prompts for the production of knowledge. And I don't just mean our own historical scholarship. Um, I think Reggie gave us a good example a little while ago about how digital work can help students become producers of knowledge and think about you know, old texts in new ways. But we all read texts quite differently. And last night at dinner, we were sort of joking, oh, I had a trouble. Ken, you had a truck that had an eight-track player, right? Mm -hmm. And Karen, you had a truck that had an eight-track player with a connection to a cassette thing, so you could convert to cassette. Okay. We don't do any of that anymore. We talked about microfilm this morning. We've talked about paper. We're talking about digital assets. Um, I think that it's probably useful for us to think as historians about how we produce our histories. And it may be possible to use some of the um, techniques that have been developed by the military, which we don't humanists like to talk about so often, or um, even the game industry, for recording how we work with digital works and how we work with actual artifacts and how we work with real objects, which would be a way of producing some kind of history of the making of history that could then be shared quite widely. And so it's just that's a possibility of what we might do in the digital world that goes beyond Consuming, 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 consuming. Not that consuming is bad, right? Which I know is on your mind because we're going to lunch. But uh, this goes away, and we're going to go back to the codex for a moment. So what I wanted to do is talk to you specifically, well, specifically, we've already seen all this. What I wanted to do is talk to you specifically about this one touch of loyal codex in the Dark Cutter Brown Library. Um, it is, as I said, made in marked paper. It's from the 18th century, probably, well, late 17th to early 18th century. It comes from the town of Santa Maria de Tetlan. Um, it is a kind of text. There are about 50 or so of this genre known. And it comes from um, a moment in time when a number of Nava speaking communities were in conflict with colonial officials about boundaries. So there was a very clear political motivation um, for these kinds of documents. Um, these documents tend to be quite consistent in the kinds of things they show and they say. And Stephanie Wood and Javier Noguez have done some interesting scholarship, um, along with other people, that have demonstrated or argued that there may well have been a studio of people producing these for other communities. Um, I wanted to show you a couple of the images that, to give you a sense of them. These documents tend to emphasize the pictorial component um, with some Nahuatl writing. Um, the writing tends to be the less important part when you kind of look at the whole page count. Um, the themes are very consistent. Ancestors, and I'm showing you an image of ancestors you see here, usually dressed in animal skins. They're kind of the chichimec warriors 
of days of old, often carrying um, bows and arrows. There are boundaries that are discussed. There are landscape features. You see a lake here. Um, in addition to old Chichimec ancestors, you see colonial figures who are important in the colonial world. And you see important indigenous leaders. You see representations of conversion from the arrival of Spaniards, the naming of a patron saint. You sort of see these reworked over and over and over again. The imagery itself is what we would call relatively simple. There's not a lot of elaborate drawing. And the Nahuatl is also relatively simple. It's not exquisite, beautifully crafted Nahuatl writing. Um, I show you two, of, two um, details here just to give you a sense of this as a genre. Um, the one on the top shows deer and see deer in the landscape and a couple of colonial ancestors. This one comes from the Kisla collection in the Library of Congress. Chichimec ancestors, but also deer in the landscape. There's the sense that every one of these has got to, got to cover the same right ground, if you will. Um, for a long, and this is a detail just to show you a sense of that kind of simple, relatively straightforward painting. Um, all in limited color palette and in terms of the ways that we understand indigenous images were made very consistently. Not on one hand, many people made these, but very consistent in the way they used ink on paper. One of the things that people have talked about for a long time with these images, um, with these codices, is whether or not they were forgeries. And in fact, the images themselves claimed at the of 16th century manufacture. Those are the dates that you read about in the documents themselves. We know now that they were made in the 18th century, late 17th or the 18th century, and they are reflections on an ancient past. So one point that I would want to make about codex like this is that it helps us understand not only what a politically motivated history looked like for indigenous communities in the late 17th and early 18th century in Mexico, but it also helps us understand what reflections on an ideal past might be, a past that could serve very particular political ends. And when we think about those things, that should remind us of a lot of other histories we know. Right? This isn't such a unique genre, such a unique idea. And yet, when we think about how these have been studied, the Tetrilateral Codices have been studied almost exclusively within the context of Mesoamerican, New Spanish, colonial Spanish American history, history making, indigenous language use. And to good effect, there have been excellent studies that have been done. I'm not in any way saying that's a bad thing. But when we think about the way that history has gone in other areas of the world, think about trans Pacific, transatlantic, circumatlantic, atmospheric. Um, yesterday there was a session on comparative histories. Indigenous peoples figure quite prominently in those ways of doing history. Indigenous images, and by that I mean images made by indigenous people, much, much, much more rarely so. And that I think is actually a problem. Um, and that leads me to the last couple of points that I want to make. So you can find the need. Um, and that is that when this comes from a new project that I've just started with Carolyn Dean, which looks at the way that indigenous images have been understood through the early modern period and then are understood today. And I'll just point out to you that images like this are still seen as, and I'll just quote a couple of different phrases, primitive, folkloric, quaint, cute, <laughs> sweet, simple. And what I want to suggest for you is that that helps us marginalize these images. And I mean us by people who work on visual imagery from the early modern people, period people who work on indigenous histories or history writ large. One thing I want to suggest in this project is that there may be something to be gained by juxtaposing indigenous images with other early modern paintings of people who had it. Now, I'm showing you an um, image of a Chinese ancestor, also an anonymous painting from about the same time. And I think this contrast makes clear, well, sure, the early modern was a big place. It was a complex place. But I also want to suggest that it may be possible to read um, a comparison like this in a more interesting way. The traditional way, and I want to say sort of mm, the last five or eight years as art history has gotten more global, 
is a kind of meanwhile back at the ranch story. Because you've got what's really going on, and then over here, sorry, I won't hit that anymore. Over here in China, you've got this interesting thing going on. And over here in the Americas, you have that interesting thing going on. And there you have it. Um, we might call it a history of juxtapositions, right? But that kind of meanwhile back at the ranch story. One of the things I'm interested in asking is whether there isn't a more important story to tell about the juxtaposition and the combination of images that come from different places in the early modern period. Um, this may not be a great comparison, but I think you get the point, right, is that we're looking at representations of people who mattered in the past to the communities that represented them, and people who mattered in the past enough to save and preserve those representations. And one thing I want to one thing I want to ask with this new word is whether sorry, we don't ask that, whether this image right here can help us work as a fulcrum and ask some different questions about what it meant to know through visual imagery the people who mattered to you and your ancestors. And also what it meant to both and what it means to both and respect particular different specific historical traditions, but also those that matter to us today. Early modernity is something that matters to many of us in a way that it certainly never mattered to many of the people who made and used these images. The last point I would end on is that when I came to the JCB as a fellow, it was in the mid-90s, and I did look at this codex, and I wrote something that um, I suspect some of you may also have written in your notes when you first came here. And that was very interesting. Come back someday? Question <laughs> mark, exclamation point, exclamation um, And I was sort of entertained to see this in my notes when I was thinking about what I might want to say to you people today. And I am now, after a long trajectory through many other things, including this project on trade with China and Mexico, interested in coming back to this document and asking more questions about how the novel is written, more questions about how it was made, but also really to think about its circulation and possibilities for circulation in an interpretive framework that I didn't know anything about before I'd met any of you people or talked to them or even when I first met you. So thank you very much. That's what I've got.